Hey everyone, welcome to the Fargo 3D Printing Podcast. Today, Jake Clark, John Schneider. Uh, we're gonna talk about 3D printing and short run production. Is it something that's good? Is it bad? When should you really pivot to traditional manufacturing? So that's what today's podcast is gonna be all about, is that. So, so. We, have, we have a lot of people that come to us with an idea and they're trying to figure out, okay, well, the idea works, I've got one 3D printed model, should I continue 3D printing these and see if I actually sell them, or should I go ahead and bite the bullet, start doing injection molding? And one of the big things to ask is, all right, well, how many of these units are you going to be producing? Because injection molding really doesn't make sense if you're doing just well, depending on the size of the part, yeah. if you're doing just a few hundred or a few thousand, it's... So it, like, like anything like this. Yeah, so this is a great example of short run production, uh, having 3D printing used for it. So what this is, is it's a badge holder. So it combines a typical ID badge. This one's just a blank. So it combines an ID badge and then an RSA security fob into one unit so that the employees only need to have one lanyard. So they can hold this on just the one lanyard. Otherwise, they'd need to have both of these on them at all times. So we had a company come to us and say that they wanted to provide this for their 3,000 employees. Now, this is where it, you know, it, it, it became a big question of, okay, does injection molding make sense for this? 3,000 of these parts, so this is actually, I think there's 26 of these on this build plate. So doing 3,000 of these, it's right at that breaking point where an injection mold tool might make sense, but in this case, what really helped, helped make the final decision was their timeline. So an injection mold tool for doing something like this, Jake, would probably cost what? I well, mean, it, it, this, this would probably require a cam, and what a cam is is just a uh, piece of metal to support an overhang or to support a feature that wouldn't uh, traditionally be in and out, and I'll explain that maybe in a little bit. Um, and this would have ran probably somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars just for the uh, injection mold tool. That doesn't include, you know, your material cost per part. Um, that doesn't include any tweaks. So, like when we got this in, we had to tweak a couple of, uh, of dimensions so that the key fob could fit, along with the ID being able to move move in and out freely. Mm -hmm. um, where then you have. Um, on the molding side, you have to go back in, and if you've already cut steel on that, you need to go back in and, and change that. So either add material, take away material. Um, in traditional manufacturing, that's a, a, a time suck and a money suck. Um, because depending on how they have to do it, sometimes they have to weld it and, and fill it back in and then machine it back out. Mm -hmm. um, and other times it's, it's easier where they can just machine it out there. Uh, I've had both cases and, and either one is not good uh, money-wise. Right. Um, well, and then from the time side of things, <clears throat> if you're doing, if you're doing a, a good mold tool out of tool steel, I mean, you're talking... Hundreds of thousands of shots. Well, right, right. I mean, I mean, so I mean, it's capable of doing hundreds of thousands of, of of shots. So if it's a single cavity mold, so meaning it does just one of these at a time, okay, that's a couple hundred thousand of these. And for that type of mold, it takes about well, I mean, we've done we have some experience with this. I mean, it takes four to eight weeks just to get the mold tool created, and that's before it gets loaded into an injection molding machine. That's before you actually run your parts through the molding machine, <clears throat> and it. So I mean, it it takes a lot of time. Now that being said. Printing, 3D printing, 3,000 of these is not a short amount of time no. either. But because we don't have to wait for that mold tool to be created, we can just start printing it right off the bat. And we can also spread this out over multiple 3D printers. I think 3D printing 30 of these is going to take about, uh, depending on how quickly we change from one build plate to another, four to six weeks. So it, it still takes that much time, but that's everything all included. Yeah. Where... Yeah, like you said, with the mold tool, if you start, you know, for we we have experience with with our uh, uh, own tool, and that took, geez, that took about three weeks just to finalize the design, make sure everything is right, get prototyping, so so FDM, SLA, um, SLS, just to make sure that that's the right right fit, form, and function. Then you cut it, um, so that's another four to six weeks. Then we had shipping, which was about added about four weeks on top of that. We missed a key date, so that actually pushed it back another three weeks. Yep. Um, and then by the time they got it in here, they had just some basic material to run. Um, the final material took about three weeks to get. Um, so you can see, and then you know it takes them a couple weeks to even run the material and fit into their schedule. So you can see how all of a sudden, you know, to make this takes months. 
now like three to six months, depending on if you know. That's worst case scenario. Right. You get you got you got companies also companies out there like Proto Labs, which yep. can turn it around in a week if you need it, and they're, that that's great. But you're going to pay for it. Yeah. Um, and they're aluminum tools, so they're not um, hardened steel, so they're not going to last for as many shots. So, and when we talk about shots, it's it's how many of these you're making. If it's like in a one cavity mold where there's only one part per mold, um, so like it, it, it kind of depends. Aluminum, there may be around ten thousand shots. Um, if you, there's certain plating you can do that can get that up up higher. Um, but then if you're looking at hardened steel, they can be hundreds of thousands of shots, if not millions. So. Right. Well, and the thing, the thing that is an advantage if you're doing <laughs> injection molding is you're going to have better surface finish. Yes. So these are still FDM printed parts. You do still have, you know, you have that roughness from the layers. You have that, uh, I mean, you can definitely, when you run your nail along it, you can feel all the different layers. And it doesn't have as smooth of a look as an injection molded part would have. <laughs> Another advantage to injection molding is, yes, your initial costs, both in time and money, are pretty high. But once you start producing... 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 of something, your per part cost starts going down dramatically, both for the amount of time it takes to produce and the amount of money it takes. Because when you're looking at just your raw materials for that, the raw materials to produce something like this, uh, like this holder are, are probably pennies when you're looking at injection molding. But there's that huge startup cost that you need to take, you need to take in mind. So when this company, when they came to us wanting to do 3,000 of these, if they wanted to start out with 3,000 and then maybe six months from now they wanted to do an additional 10,000 and maybe after that they want to do another run of 20 or 50,000, then injection molding would absolutely make sense for this project. But for this, 3D printing made the most sense. And I mean, if, if it started getting up to the point where they even needed 10,000 of these, injection molding might make more sense because it takes about the same amount of time to print just one of these per part. So let's say I think it takes about an hour and a half to print one of these. And if I'm printing 26 on a build plate, that takes about 24 hours. So it gets a little bit faster when you do large numbers, but not a dramatic increase. Yeah, where your cycle times for something like that on a, on a tool would be maybe 20 seconds. Yeah, 20, 20, 30 seconds. So, but you have to buy in that volume to get the same per part, per part uh, cost. So it, it, like John was saying, it, it all depends. And each project kind of, you know, if you're, if you're sitting there like, hey, I got this part, you know, like, let's say this jigging fixture here. Hey, I got this part. Do I want, you know, do I want to mold it? Do I want to 3D print it? What's the best situation? It, 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 it's a per... Uh, case by case basis. It's a case by case because sometimes, you know, like this works great. <clears throat> like this jig, I, you know, I was only going to make 10, 15 of these. Um, it, I mean, their 3D printing absolutely yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then... It also depends on what your part function is. You know, what's what's the end end use of that part? Because if you're looking for you know something that has good strength in all directions, 3D printing might not be, especially FDM, because of the layer uh, adhesion, the layer by layer. Yeah. Um, there there is that um, um, Delamin part. Yeah, delamination. There's that yeah. part that you need to think. What am I trying to say? I'm fumbling my words here. Uh, it's been one of those days. It um, is a Monday, people. So uh, yeah, this might be dropping on Friday, but it is. We're definitely in Monday mode. We're we're trying. Oh, but um, so that that's one thing. And then like snap fits aren't great with FDM. So you you need to you need to take that case by case. And sometimes, you know, big parts, the size of this table, um, are better three D printed than traditional molding. Um, or again, CNC. unless unless you're producing something in very large quantities to do something. And I mean, injection mold tools for something the size of this table do exist. And we've seen them <laughs> but, in person. But the mold tools, you're looking at millions. I mean, you're, you're looking, millions yeah, of you're, yeah, you're looking at about a million dollars for the mold tool. I probably over a million dollars for the injection molding machine to even run it on, because it to, for something to hold the mold tool that big, mm. you need a big injection molding machine, and oh, you're yeah. probably going to be running 200, two, yeah, 200 pounds of plastic per shot. That's a lot of plastic material for this. Now, if you're producing 10,000 like, like, of them... Like your totes. Let's, let's look at your, like your totes that you use yeah. for packing clothes away. That uses, uh, you know, if you think of that, now think of adding, you know, you have to have that entire depth. So you need to have something that's this wide for a mold tool because you got to have all your different uh, um, add-ons behind it. You know, your, your ejector pins, the, the plates to connect that tool to yep. the platen and all that good stuff. Um, so you, you know, that wide in one direction and then the width 
I mean, it's you can see how um, you need a big machine to support that. Right. So another type of thing where 3D printing makes more sense for production versus injection molding or CNC machining is if it's not possible to make it using injection molding yes. or CNC machining. Now this part, um, it has a lot of complexity to it. I think this would be able to be injection molded, but it'd be difficult to, actually this one might not be too too bad. But when you're looking it'd at something- It'd be a very, very expensive mold because of all the intricacies. Right, and then when you're looking at something it, like in the aerospace industry, so the GE, uh, one of the fuel nozzles for the LEAP engine, that's one of the things that gets brought up a lot. GE has invested tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in metal 3D printing machines to make these parts because they can't be CNC machined accurately enough because they have different internal chambers. It can't be made accurately enough just using machining. So that's where 3D printing, even though they're going to be producing them in the tens of thousands of units, it needs to be 3D printing. It just can't be done any other way. Yeah, so there, that's a case where you, you might have no other choice. Um, those are rare cases, but they are cases that we see, in, and metal is the best one out there right now. Small, complex, intricate parts yeah. are best metal 3D printed versus CNC. Yeah. Um, because so, Well, and then some other things that metal 3D printing is being used for for production is for doing parts of injection molding tools. Not the entire mold tool, because when you're talking an injection mold tool, it's a, it's a huge block of steel. That, yeah. it, it'd be... It's extremely expensive to 3D print that. It would be economical. But what you can do is have the larger part of the block traditionally CNC machined out and then 3D print an insert that goes in there. So that insert might be might be something that has a cooling channel in it or something that is a very intricate, you know, it makes it, it's a very intricate part of the mold mm -hmm. and it's just not possible to do or it's, it's not economical to do. or something in there. Right. So there's where 3D printing can also be used for production. And that's not necessarily short run. That can be full on long run production. And then if you look at like the, the medical side of it too, you know, with implants and things, that's where 3D printing really makes sense. And then if you start looking at dental um, a little bit more specifically, um, we had the pleasure of, of, uh, of looking at some of the Broadway machines and those have some really nice dental models that come off of it where you can, you know, you can use it to cast and you can do this with other 3D printers as well. Um, but you can use it to cast your molds for your rings or for your uh, crowns and actually use that as the, um, as the, you know, so to speak, the final part. Right. Um, so that's an interesting one where, you know, they, like, they scan your mouth, they take that, you print it out. So none of that nasty orthodontist purple stuff they stick in your mouth. Yeah, for, like that dental silicone. Oh, that was nasty. Yeah. Um, so really no more of that. Uh, they just scan it and print it. And that's where... You know, now they can start making sure things fit without you having to come back every single time and, and check the fit and make sure it's working. They can actually see that um, out. So that's that's right. a case where traditional, I'm going to call it traditional uh, manufacturing process of that uh, uh, purple slime is uh, not the best. And, and now they can they can change that to something that's a 3D printed part. Well, and when you're looking at the Prodways machine, for example, so it has a larger build area and the way, so the Prodways machine works a little differently from other SLA machines. So it actually breaks up all of the, uh, breaks up the entire build area into a grid. And then it takes the, uh, takes a mirror and reflects the, the, the DLP projection. So it projects in the different grids until you have your complete part. So what that allows you to do is print multiple dental models on the same bed. So you're not just doing one at a time, but this is another form of short run production. The way that this is different from this type of short run production where we're printing a few thousand of the same model is you're printing a lower quantity of these dental models, but each one is different. Each one is different and distinct. So a really good example of dental 3D printing uh, is Invisalign braces. So the actual trays, the plastic trays that you put in your mouth, those aren't 3D printed, but they 3D print the forms that then a, f a sheet of plastic is thermoformed over. So what they do, you basically have a model of your, your teeth, and then they bring that plastic down over the top. And you could print out, you could have it so it's printing all 30 or so of these different models of your mouth going from, okay, here's where it is now to where the final, you know, the final uh, tooth arrangement should be and have all those trays printed out 
Well, print, having the, the forms printed out and then having yeah. the trays molded around it. Some, someday they might print the trays, but yeah. I'm not sure when. And, and one, one thing that uh, I thought was interesting, so you know how you have it go on each spot and you shoot that camera on, it's actually, um, so the mirror is moving. And, and the one that they're working on right now that I think they're gonna come out with next year yeah. is you actually have a mirror that's angled like this. And on the back, you have the camera that moves and then this moves back and forth. Well, a projector. So just, I'm just yeah. going to correct you on a couple of things. So it's a, it's a projector and they actually, that mirror is there now. Yeah. And, and so, but it's going but to it's, change. It's not, it's not how it wants to, it's not how they, they fully, uh, um, so, so what they're doing, it. what they're doing right now is they have each grid as a separate distinct yeah. object. So it does, okay, flash, flash, flash. But what they're going to do is they're going to have it scrolling. So flash, if that makes sense. <laughs> But yeah, so so it it's they're they're going to be able to use the same hardware. It's going to be a software update, which yeah. which it it also means that you're going because right now when you have the different grids, sometimes you can see the lines in between if there's just a slight misalignment of those uh, of the pixels. I yeah. mean, it's it's pretty close if you have a well aligned. You, machine, you gotta it won't be an issue. calibrate it. It's like anything. You gotta you gotta calibrate it so it works correctly. Otherwise, if you never calibrate it, it's never gonna work. Right. It's but like with anything. that with that scrolling light, it's going to help eliminate that even further. So it will be completely unnoticeable. And I think it's going to improve the speed too because instead of having it, okay, you, one shot and then there's that inertia to move it and then that inertia to slow it down to do the next one. The amount of energy it takes to speed it up, slow it down. Now it's going to be able to be just one smooth motion. So it's going to take less energy. It's going to be able to do it more quickly too. Yeah. So that'll be an exciting machine to see how that gets used, not only in dental, but in other applications with, with uh, SLA and DLP. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, because they have some interesting materials. Like they have, I don't know if these are the ones that are available in North America, but they actually have some that are, they're really close approximation to bone. Well, so, and ceramics too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ceramics. Ceramics. Yeah. So that's that. That's actually the material that is close to bone. Is it has? It's that yeah. light curing part of it, but then it also has all the different ceramic chips. Yeah. And you just cook densities. it, and it, and it shrinks a little bit, but you cook it or kill it, whatever you want to call it, and then right. it uh, cure it. Whatever. Fire it. Yeah. There's so many terms you can use, but once you cure it, um, then uh, it'll be counting that ceramic part. You get a little bit of shrink, but. Well, it's like any sort of like any sort of yeah. clay work or any other type of ceramic. It's when all that moisture goes out, or in this case, when that that plastic bonding agent is burned out yep. or heated up or melted at some form of that, then yeah. you have your only ceramic parts left. Yeah. So neat technology, not available in the U.S., but it's cool to see where that's going to kind of kind of take that. And it's also going to be interesting. So. When we look at um, production in the future, you know, we, we get a lot of people like, oh, 3D printing is gonna replace injection molding. Oh, it's gonna take over that. It, it's not, it's, it's a different sector. It's like seeing, it's like if you have, uh, there, in the, even in plastics, there's different kinds of, of processes. There's extrusion, there's plastic injection molding, there's blow molding, there's- uh, Film, pipe, yeah, I mean like film extrusion, there's- There's yeah, so, many, so many, so many processes of, of plastics that 3D printing isn't going to necessarily take away a big part of injection molding. It might take away a small percentage, um, but it's stuff like this that it might might start taking away. Well, and what I'm thinking, it's not so much that it takes away from injection molding, but it, ena it enables a project that otherwise wouldn't have been able to happen. Yes. So if 3D printing wasn't around for this, the company would have either had to go out and have 100,000 of these produced, which won't be economical for them, or they'd have to wait for someone else to come out with a product, with this being that product. So it, I mean, 3D printing helps solve that problem. It doesn't really take away from an injection molding because um, otherwise this company wouldn't have, they just wouldn't have these. They, they would have had to have the two separate lanyards, one for their RSA fob, the other one for their, uh, for their ID badge. Yeah. So I, I think you're gonna see more 3D printing and uh, help um, support injection molding and maybe get the, get the ball rolling for injection molding, um, but it's never gonna completely take over it, no. and I, think, I, I don't think. And I think it's actually going to help grow injection molding a little bit more. Uh, we hear a lot now that a lot of injection molding is coming from China back to the United States, and you have a lot of people that have product ideas, and 3D printing is a much more accessible uh, it's a much more accessible product for them or a, a process for them. So they're able to start 3D printing, maybe sell a few hundred or a few thousand of whatever their idea is to start raising the funds to then start doing injection molding. Well, that's like uh, the the helper for Square. This is a, yep. this is an older story. Um, so but little little background on it. So a Square reader, it's that little thing that you put into your iPad so that you can read credit cards. The problem is 
it spins. It just spins freely in the headphone jack. And the square mm -hmm. helper was developed to just, is just a little thing that went in between the square reader and the iPad to stop it from rotating. I mean, it's not a very complicated concept. It's, it's very simple, but it's extremely useful and helpful. And the part itself actually isn't very complicated to be injection molded, but this is a case where the, the user or, or the creator said, hey, I don't want to go spend 10 to 15 to 20 thousand dollars on something I don't know if there's a market for. And right. then they went and 3D printed and now um, I think he's still, I'm, I'm not sure, um, I just thought of this so I haven't, haven't done uh, digging on this, but I know at the last time I heard um, he was still 3D printing them, um, which now it might make more sense to go traditional manufacturing with injection molding because I think he now has that client base. But that's right. where all of a sudden you can see, okay, does it make more sense to invest in more, more 3D printers? Or does it make more sense to go to molding tool? What's, you know, you have to, you have to play that trade, trade off and right. see what's going to be, you know, cause you might get, you know, 50% cost reduction by going injection molding, but you're if you front. reach a certain quantity, exactly. Right. So that's where you need to really play with that and, and see when is the best fit to, to either turn or, or go. Cause there's another, another case where that actually happened, um, for, for a company there. 3D printing two individual components and then putting the circuit board in it, putting the lid on and the cord and all that good stuff. And it got to the point where it's like, okay, we have a really huge demand for this and people want it. Uh, the surface finish isn't what they're happy with and the company knew because they're 3D printed. Right. And uh, so now they're like, all right, let's cut steel. I know I have a customer base. I, you know, they, they pretty much got a PO from a couple big clients saying, here, we want this, and this is what we're willing to, uh, to, 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 to order to get this. And then that allowed them to go and get the funding to get the tools made to get them actually in traditional manufacturing. And a third example of this is, uh, I mean, this is a really good example, uh, Lulzbot. So they develop a 3D printer. If you're not already familiar with it, there's a lot of 3D printed parts on it. So they try and use as many off-the-shelf components as possible, but when something custom is needed, they try and have it uh, 3D printed because that way, I mean, there's a lot of 3D printed components on the Lulzbot. Yes. Uh, the Lulzbot systems. Well, pretty and, much all the plastic parts. Yeah. But what they're starting to do now is because they're so successful with their current printers and they're starting to see larger and larger volumes of their printers sold, is now injection molding is starting to become economical for them. So some of the parts where maybe it's four or six of the same part used in the printer, they're going to start injection molding those. It's not for the Lulzbot Mini, it's not for the TAS 5, but it's for the next version of the Lulzbot TAS and presumably for the next version of the Lulzbot Mini as well. Some of the more common currently 3D printed components are going to start being injection molded because it's not even so much a surface finish thing that they're trying to achieve. It's just that their cost per part. Well, that and functionality, I think, too, wasn't it? A little bit of that. Now, what they are losing by going to injection molding is they won't be able to change their designs as quickly. So I think what we're going to start seeing from Lulzbot is instead of a rapid development cycle is you're going to start seeing more polished versions of the printers, but instead of seeing, I know what the Lulzbot has, I think within a, an 18-month period, they they released five versions, six if you count the four point, you know, some of the interim versions, maybe even more than that. Now I think you're going to start seeing it maybe one per year or one every year and a half. You're going to see a more traditional years. kind right. of. Right. But now it's, it's getting to the point where they, I mean, they have the ability to really sit and polish and get their, you know, get their machines working really well instead of, okay, here's the new version. Let's get this out. Okay. Already in before they're even real on or before they're even releasing that new version, they're already working on the version after that. Which is good. I mean, then they, they're still developing at that pace, but now their actual releases are just starting to be more more polished and more spread out. Yeah. And injection molding is a part of that because it helps them lower their cost and yeah. hopefully hopefully improve margins. Or if they keep the margins the same, that means more technology in the printers, more advancement, more development. Hopefully, better user interfaces. The maybe it's yeah. better better support, better uh, just just any of that because that's really where that goes towards is it just builds the company better so that they can iterate more and and uh be oh what's the term i'm trying to look for lean no not lean okay. um innovative innovative well lean too because <laughs> sometimes you don't need certain aspects um you just need to know when to when to cut the fat off the off the uh off the business so that's where um i think like you said you'll see the lulzbot go towards a more traditional structure with i think some of their parts and uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, I'm assuming that those are going to be open source files still. Oh yeah, they're still. Yeah, I mean, FreeCAD. FreeCAD is the, the file format. It's all up on their. Uh, it's all up on their development site. I think it's. Uh, I want to say it's devel.lulzbot.com. It's, it's kind of it's it's cool having an open source company like that because you're able to see how their development process is going and 
uh, even their production timeline. So it's looking like they're they're going to have that ready to release. Be interesting to see if they have Santa Clara. February, they won't. That, that I don't even think they've started their beta versions yet at Santa Clara, or that in their in their facility. I don't know. I could be wrong. Never know. Yeah, last year they uh, they unveiled the Lulzbot Mini in our booth. Yep, and they didn't start shipping that until. I think March. mid, no, no, mid, mid January is when we got our first pallet of them. Was it? Yep. So they were pretty far along, but yeah, yeah they weren't. Oh, yeah, quite, we picked up their polished. prototype because we went and met with, with the folks at Lulzbot and then from that we picked up their, their, uh, their prototype and, and drove it out to, to Santa Clara. So that was kind of interesting. We're the first ones really to, to handle the, the, the beta outside of them. Right. So, and they're wor they're a workhorse. They're actually running some production stuff for us right now. Yeah, they're one of the they're one of the machines. So the Lulzbot Mini is not this part. We have another part for a client. They're doing fifty of something, and it's an eight hour print. But but what they were doing before is they were having it fabricated in metal, oh. which I mean not not three D printed, but actually yeah. welded together. So that it's a lot more labor intensive to to have that done, especially when you're talking a cylinder probably four inches in diameter, uh, six inches tall. It just it gets to Still, be, it, gets to be it, a lot, and then, then material costs too. So 3D printing, that's where it made sense for them. It actually costs less per part than it did when they were working with the metal part. Now, it takes eight hours for each print, and we can only fit one of those on each build plate, but it, it works out well for them. And the timeline, you know, for them, it's not really that important. And injection molding would be very difficult to do with this part. I mean, the amount of I, I, don't, I don't even want to know the amount of uh, the amount of moving pieces you'd need to have in that mold tool to actually make this happen. But I don't know. I mean, that 3D, one, oh. 3D printing for short run production is something that I'm sure will continue to change. Um, As it's, new it's technology maybe comes out, and, and, and even in the next six to twelve months, it's something that we'll probably come back and visit again, uh, especially as more interesting projects come across our desk. And if you see anything interesting in 3D printed short run production, or, or if you're if, doing something, or if you have any questions on, okay, I've, I've got an idea, where's, where's kind of the breaking point? We can help you do some of that stuff. So feel free to throw those questions down in the comments, or if it's something you don't want to show up in the comments section, shoot us an email yep. uh, at support at fargo3dprinting.com, and we can help you work through some of that stuff. Uh, but I think, Jake, unless you've got anything else, I think that about... Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that takes care of that for us this week. So on behalf of myself, John Schneider, and Jake Clark, we want to thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, whether this is on iTunes, you're listening, or YouTube, you're watching. Uh, we're active on a bunch of different social media channels. So just reach out. We're always interested in hearing from you. And if you're in Santa Clara next month, I know we'll probably talk about some more. Um, definitely come, come check us out. Yeah. So again, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. So oh god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one too. Okay, now the front of this one's a little bit out. <laughs>